VIN Future Prize, a new global science and technology prize for humanity from Vietnam. One VIN Future Grand Prize of $3 million. Three additional special VIN Future Prizes valued at $500,000 each. VIN Future Prize honors science and technology work that creates or has a high potential to create meaningful change in the everyday lives of millions of people. Join us to make a change for a better future. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on wherever you're joining us from. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the October Innovator webinar hosted by the VFuture Foundation titled Smart Materials for Energy Harvesting and Storage. As usual, my name is Tao Chen, and I'm going to be your moderator for today's webinar. Now, we are excited to have each and every single one of you joining us here today with us as we embark on an intriguing webinar about the topic of smart materials. We also revolve, this discussion today also revolves around the incredible scope of energy harvesting and storage through these intelligent materials. We look forward to having an engaging and illuminating session with all of you. Now, please allow me to introduce to you our panelists for today's webinar. Joining as our chair is Professor Kostya Novoselov, laureate of the 2010 Nobel Prize in Physics, member of the V Future Prize Council. He is best known for isolating graphene at the University of Manchester in 2004 and is an expert in condensed matter physics and nanotechnology. Joining as our distinguished speaker is Professor Antonio Castro Nato, distinguished professor in the Department of Material Science, Engineering and Physics. He is also the director of the Center for Advanced 2D Materials and co-director of the Institute for Functional Intelligent Materials at the National University of Singapore. And last but definitely not least, our representative of the Vietnamese scientific community, Dr. Hiu Nguyen, the top 10 outstanding young faces of Vietnam in 2021 and the laureate of the 2021 Vietnam Golden Globe Awards for Sci in Science and Technology for Young Scientists. And now before we get to officially meet with our speakers, we'd like to invite you to keep watch for a short trailer that serves as great materials to introduce you to the topic for the webinar today. Please take a look. Since the dawn of humanity, our quest for superior materials has been ceaseless. From primitive tools crafted from stone by our ancestors millions of years ago, to the revolutionary discovery of metals and the emergence of even stronger materials like iron and steel, our desire for progress has driven us to constantly seek advancements in materials. In 2008, the National Academy of Engineering identified 14 game-changing goals for the 21st century, crucial challenges that must be tackled if we want to advance as a species. As we strive towards progress, many of these challenges necessitate the utilization of cutting-edge materials. As technology advances, we are driven to explore the possibilities of smart materials, the very building blocks that can shape our modern civilization. Experience the VinFuture Foundation's newest InnovaTalk webinar, Smart Materials for Energy Harvesting and Storage. The webinar will be chaired by Professor Sirkostia Novoselov, laureate of the 2010 Nobel Prize in Physics, member of the VinFuture Prize Council. Every year since 2014, Professor Novoselov has been included in the list of the most highly cited researchers in the world. Professor Novoselov holds the position of Tan Chin Tuan Centennial Professor at the National University of Singapore and also the part-time Langworthy Professor of Physics and the Royal Society Research Professor at the University of Manchester. He is best known for his 2010 Nobel Prize award-winning work of isolating graphene at the University of Manchester in 2004. Featured as the distinguished speaker is Professor Antonio Castro Nato, distinguished professor in the Department of Materials Science, Engineering and Physics. He is also director of the Center for Advanced 2D Materials and co-director of the Institute for Functional Intelligent Materials at National University of Singapore. Professor Nito will present the future of battery technology during the October InnovaTalk webinar. 
with valuable information and important knowledge promised to be shared during the webinar, this is an excellent opportunity for interested audiences to gain a better understanding of the progress and development of battery technology, especially in solid-state batteries, laying the foundation for a sustainable energy future. And finally, featured as the special guest in the webinar, the representative of Vietnam is Dr. Hugh Nguyen. The top 10 outstanding young faces of Vietnam in 2021 and the laureate of the 2021 Vietnam Golden Globe Awards in Science and Technology for Young Scientists. Dr. Hugh Nguyen completed his PhD in solar photovoltaics at the Australian National University in 2016. Currently, he holds the position of Senior Research Fellow and Senior Lecturer at the ANU, as well as serving as editor of the journal IEE Transactions on Electron Devices. Prepare to embark on a knowledge-filled journey as our webinar showcases three remarkable speakers and an array of insightful presentations. Join us at the InnovaTalk webinar, Smart Materials for Energy Harvesting and Storage, hosted by the VIN Future Foundation. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I am beyond honored and excited to introduce to you our highly esteemed shared for today's webinar is Professor Kostya Novoselov laureate of the 2010 Nobel Prize in Physics for his achievements with graphene. He's also a member of the Vin Future Prize Council. We're privileged to have Professor Novoselov guiding us through the enlightening discussions of today's webinar. And without any further delay, I humbly pass the virtual stage to you, Professor Novoselov, as we e eagerly await for your insights and guidance. Good afternoon. It's really a great, great pleasure to, to, to be here today. Uh, last year, I uh, presented my work on this uh, at this seminar, and it's really a great privilege for me to be a chair today. And of course, the the topic for some people it might look a bit controversial. What materials has to do with the uh, with the with with energy? It's quite unfortunate that still these days we rely mainly on burning fossil fuels to 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 get our energy. And sometimes the trend is actually going going into the wrong direction. Last year there was a, an increase in in burning coal across the across the globe. And yet I would say that new materials and new technologies are probably the our best hope and our best uh, our best uh, chance to 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 tackle uh, climate uh, climate uh, change. Um, Today I'm um, a little bit. Uh, it's it's a bit awkward for me because I'm 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 joining you not from my office. I'm actually at the UN conference for the um, for, for the for the climate change, and this the, the this conference is happening in uh, in Riyadh in the kingdom of of Saudi Arabia. And you would think that the focus of the conference would be the management of of of, of oil and gas. And yet, the biggest focus here is the transformation of energy and, and how it, 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 is, it, is, uh, it is guided by the materials transformation. And indeed, materials these days are, is, is now the dominant player in the, in the world to technology and new materials and smart materials are the dominant player in the world to, to technology of the, of the energy transformations from batteries, to solar cells, from the uh, from the uh, from the fuel cells to to uh, supercapacitors, as well as many other um, uh, minor minor approaches to, to to energy gathering. Anyway, I will leave I will leave the the uh, chance the, and this privilege to discuss the future of materials for energy harvesting and, 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 and storage to our speakers. And let me introduce our, um, our speakers today. So our speaker is, uh, today is a, a fantastic scientist and my very good friend, um, Antonia, Antonia Castroneta. And he has a very bright and maybe very unusual career in, uh, in physics. So he, uh, he received his, uh, his Bachelor and Master of Science from uh, from Brazil, and then 
and then a PhD from, from uh, Urbana Champagne. And his, uh, most, most of his career was in, uh, in strongly correlated matter uh, in, in theoretical physics. In theoretical physics, this, this topic is considered to be uh, the, really the top in complexity and, uh, and, and in, the, in the use of, of the mathematical apparatus. And, and uh, he was one of the first to apply it for the new, uh, for the new materials uh, discovered in 2004 for the two-dimensional materials. He was the first theorist who, who started to work on the, on the two-dimensional materials and then made a fantastic career and, and a very interesting turn when he moved from, uh, from theoretical uh, physicist to, to become a director of the, one of the most successful experimental centers in, in the world for the, for the research in graphene. And then later, he, he, uh, we are together the co-directors of the, of the new, again, experimental center for the, to the, for the uh, smart intelligent materials in uh, National University of of, of Singapore, so he really represents the two sides of the of, of the story, both experimental, theoretical, and he is really advanced in applying those new materials and new technologies for the for the real life applications. Let me also introduce our our uh, uh, our special guest, Dr. Hugh Gian. So he was already briefly introduced by our by our host. Dr. Nguyen earned his PhD in solar photovoltaics from the Australian National University in, in 2016, followed by a stint as a visiting scientist at the U.S. National Renewable Energy Lab. Currently, he holds the position of senior research fellow at ANU and serves as an editor of IEEE transactions on electron devices. Dr. Nguyen has received multiple awards for his teaching and uh, uh, supervision, including a new Dean's Award for Excellence in Supervision and Dean's Award for Excellence in, in Teaching. In, in 2021, he received the Vietnam Golden Globe Award in Science and Technology for Young Scientists, and he was selected as one of the 10 outstanding young faces in, in Vietnam in, in 2021. And later we will hear about the, the scientific and research interest from, from Dr. Nguyen. So uh, now, without further ado, let me ask uh, Professor Antonia Castroneta to start our um, the scientific part of our of our seminar and tell us about the uh, the uh, importance of new materials for energy transformation. Costa, thank you very much for this very generous introduction. So let me uh, share my screen here with you. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, battery technology. Um, and of course, uh, I want to talk about the future. But in order to uh, imagine what the future looks like, we need to think about the past. And uh, the, of course, the history of battery technology goes back to Napoleonic type times. Uh, here you see uh, Alessandro Volta. Uh, presenting the first prototype of a workable battery to Napoleon. Of course, he's probably asking for money <laughs> or to Napoleon to su support his research. I'm sure it was something like this. And uh, you can see this is a very old story. And uh, the principle of a battery is actually quite simple. Uh, you have uh, two electrodes, uh, an anode and a cathode. And then uh, you have ions, say lithium ions, that move from one electrode to another, creating an electric current on the external circuit. So essentially generating electric charge. And a rechargeable, rechargeable battery is exactly a battery where you can do this reversibly. Right, so very, very simple. So in a normal battery, the ions, they move through a liquid medium, which is called electrolyte, right? And when ions move through a, 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 a liquid medium, uh, the liquid becomes hot. And when the liquid becomes hot, it produces gas. 
And this gas can expand and sometimes it leads to an explosion. So from time to time, uh, we hear about uh, some electric car exploding or something like this. And it comes from exactly this friction between the motion of the ions and the liquid. OK, so there is a real issue here about safety associated with liquid based batteries. So then uh, people uh, start to think whether we can replace the liquid electrolyte by a solid electrolyte. So a solid state battery works more or less on the same principles as the liquid one. You have a cathode and an anode, and then the solid electrolyte is a material that can transport ions, but it cannot transport electrons, right? So it has to be an uh, electronic insulator and an ionic conductor. So you might ask, are there many materials that, that have these properties? And indeed, there are several that have been studied uh, over the years. Uh, and usually, the way people deal with this is trial and error. So they, uh, they make different crystals of different materials, and then they test whether it, it, this material can conduct ions or not. Uh, so we came to this problem because we wanted to understand how can an ion move in a solid, right? So how can I make a very good ionic conductor? So think about lithium. So the lithium atom uh, is relatively small atom. Uh, it has uh, a diameter of 1.5 angstrom. Uh, the lithium atom, the lithium ions is slightly smaller is a 0 0.7 angstrom in size. And of course, this is more or less uh, the uh, scale of the distance between the atoms inside of a crystal, okay? It's a few angstrom. So you might ask, how can something uh, that size can move inside of a, such a tight space? And also, are the, is the motion of the lithium this described by the laws of classical physics? So like a billiard ball bouncing around and going from one side to another? Or is there quantum physics in this? Are electrons important in the, the, when the lithium moves from one side to another inside of the uh, crystal? So this is exactly the type of questions that drove us into this, this field. We wanted to understand how can something like this happen? So um, these are experimental data on, uh, on several different types of uh, solid electrolytes. Uh, on log-log scale, on log, semi-log scale, you see the log of the ionic conductivity plot, plot, plot versus the inverse temperature. So, and what you see is uh, when you look at this data, one thing is very clear, is that there is a exponential behavior going on. So the uh, conductivity depends exponentially on the temperature. Why is that? So to understand this exponential behavior is actually relatively simple. A crystal, is a periodic system. So there is a potential that is seen by the lithium atoms, and this potential has minima, maxima, and settle points. So for a lithium atom to move inside of a crystal, it has to go from one minima to another. By doing what? By jumping over the settle points. So if the energy of the lithium atom is too small, it becomes blocked around the minima of the potential, so it cannot move. So only the uh, lithium atoms that have thermal energy above the saddle point energy are the ones that can move. So only a tail of the thermal distribution actually contributes to the conductivity. The number of ions is an exponential uh, dependent on, on the temperature. So it's a very simple explanation for the exponential dependence. Now, the, the difficult question is that the, the, that the conductivity is not only the number of ions. The conductivity is given by the charge of the ion, the number of ions, and the mobility of the ions. So the, although you see straight lines in the experimental data, what the, the real question is, what determines the slope? 
which is essentially giving by the eye on mobility. So this is the, the big question to be answered in this field. What determines the ionic mobility? What are the, the microscopic parameters that control the ionic mobility of, a, of an ion a crystal? Uh, just to put this into uh, uh, context, that these types of questions were the same questions that uh, people in the 1950s and 1960s were asking about electrons in semiconductors. So the, how good a, a semiconductor is, is essentially determined by the electron mobility. And here is essentially the same, same story. How good an ionic conductor is, is determined by the ionic mobility. So this is a very fundamental question that dates back from semiconductor uh, uh, physics, let's put this way. So now we have to understand the differences between liquid electrolytes and solid electrolytes. So essentially the fundamental difference is symmetries. Uh, what I mean is that liquids like gases, they have, you have uh, symmetry of translation, you have symmetry of rotation, but in a solid, because you have a crystal lattice, these symmetries are broken. We say that they are broken. They don't exist. They are reduced by the presence of the crystal. So these broken symmetries essentially are the ones that determine the ion mobility. Okay, so the what I what I, what I usually say, and many people don't like, but I think it's true, is that you have to change completely the concepts uh, in electrochemistry, which essentially dictate how uh, particles move in liquid medium, to solid state physics, which is essentially what you know people in the semiconductor uh, industry have been doing for many many years. So it's a completely different story. So uh, 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 last year we published this this paper that I'm very proud. Uh, it's called the Microsco microscopic theory of ionic motion uh, in uh, solids with these young people, uh, Alex, uh, Kayan, and Alexandra, uh, where we essentially, for the first time, we try to address exactly that issue: what controls this uh, the the ionic mobility in crystals, and this this is what uh, we're trying to address here. I'm not going to tell you details, of course. Uh, you know this is very technical, but I'm going to give you the final result, which is essentially a formula for the ionic mobility that didn't exist before. So this formula, which is uh, written here, gives the inverse of the ionic mobility, which is usually called the friction coefficient. So essentially it tells us uh, how the ions, as they move through the crystal, they are losing energy to the crystal by means of producing, say, heat uh, in the crystal, okay? And what you can see here are very uh, basic uh, microscopic parameters. So this... Uh, Rho here is essentially the ionic density, is the crystal density. So the more dense the crystal is, the higher the mobility. These Vs are the sound velocities, the longitudinal and transverse sound velocities. So you see that the mobility is proportional to the, uh, mobility is proportional to the velocity to the cube power, which is a very high power, which means that uh, stiff materials, which transmit sound very fast, will also conduct essentially ions very well. And finally, there is a, a, a more complicated mathematical uh, uh, element here, which is uh, called the Hessian matrix. The Hessian matrix in an uh, in, uh, isotropic system is equivalent to what's called the Laplacian which is the second derivative of the potential uh, in respect to the position. So that 
that's the, what this equation, this part of the equation uh, tells us is that the topology of the crystal structure is actually fundamental in determining the ionic mobility. So uh, the, the, the points where these Hessian vanish, which are essentially give very large mobility are essentially the saddle points. They were the saddle regions of the potential. So what this equation is telling us is that smooth potentials smooth potentials, crystal potentials, are the ones that are going to produce the highest ionic mobility in solids. Okay, so as I said, this is the first time this formula was derived, and it gives us lots of clues uh, about how to search better materials for solid state batteries. Okay, um, so going back to this formula, we actually have calculated this, uh, this Hessian. Uh, this is not an easy task. It's computationally a very heavy calculation because you have to solve the crystal potential using uh, mathematical computational methods. Uh, in this case, we use density functional theory to calculate this potential. So extremely heavy uh, computationally to to, to, to do. More recently, we have used uh, at, the, at the Institute for Functional Intelligent Materials, we developed a method using machine learning to actually speed up this calculation. So we don't have to wait. Instead of waiting for weeks to get the result, we can get the result in seconds. So we're using all the, the the, the power of machine learning uh, to, to do these calculations. And the interesting thing is that for at least some simple elements, uh, simple materials like uh, silver chlorate, lithium chlorate, lithium iodine, and, uh, and so on, we get numbers which are uh, quite comparable with the experimental results. But we're not there yet because these calculations were done for single crystals. And our measurements so far are done in polycrystalline systems. But we are now at NUS, uh, we are now growing new crystals, uh, new solid electrolytes based on this formula, uh, exactly trying to get the highest possible ionic mobilities. So just to conclude uh, I, I, uh, this, so uh, this uh, the solid state battery technology, as I said, just like semiconductor technology, depends crucially on the ion mobility, how we're going to increase the ionic mobility in crystals, right? So it's the same problem we had uh, in the early 60s for electrons, very, very similar. Then uh, unlike uh, liquid-based uh, batteries, uh, the, 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 the mobility depends on the geometry and topology of the crystal structure, which is completely different from what you see uh, in liquid batteries. And uh, essentially, uh, as I said, the progress depends on material scientists create new materials that are structurally hard and atomically smooth. So with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for inviting me to be here. Now, um, I've got lots of questions because on this, uh, even though I followed a little bit this on this work, but uh, for now, let me invite the Dr. Hume Gian to present uh, an alternative, uh, an alternative solution of, uh, on uh, to, on the uh, on the future of of our energy generation. So, Dr. Gian, please uh, can we, can we uh, share your your screen? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Hugh Nguyen from the Australian National University. First, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here in the Green Future uh, Prize Innova talk. And before going into the detail, I would like to give you a little bit background about my talk today. In a broad term, a solar panel contains a number of solar cells connected together to build up voltage and current and the solar cell is the key component of a solar panel. For individual solar cells inside a solar panel, at the moment, there are more than 10 different 
technology being developed in the laboratory environment around the world. However, regardless of the technologies over the past 30 years, people keep chasing record efficiency for every single technology. Why? Because getting higher efficiency is the most direct way to reduce the cost of solar photovoltaics. But the high efficiency number, there are not only sales publication, but also many other heavy lifting research works to make it happen. And today in my talk, I will cover the supporting works that my team is doing at the Australian National University. I will cover the fundamental properties of the materials, technique developments, and material engineering for both established and emerging technologies. Now let's go to the detail. When we are giving a piece of material and we want to make a solar cell with it, one very first question you need to ask, how much light can it absorb or how thick our material should be to absorb all of the incident light? With the same material, depending on how well we design our solar cell, we can have more light absorption. And for each case, we need to have real measurement. My team is doing a little bit differently. For each material, it has its own absorption coefficient. This property represents for how well a certain material can absorb light. And my team established this fundamental parameter for both proven and emerging materials in uh, solar photovoltaics. And based on this parameter, as long as you know what materials you are working with and what solar cell design, basically we can predict how much, how much sunlight is going to be absorbed without doing the measurement again. So that's our approach. The next situation, now you're given 10 different materials to make the solar cell. How do you know which material or promises to start with? So when a material of soft light, they will pre-emit into the environment a different light with different energy level. We capture the absorbed light and the light emitted. Then we can calculate how many electrons generated by the incident light inside the materials. And with this method, we can predict the maximum voltage of a solar cell fabricated from that material. And these are the data for Burosky material with different thicknesses of hundreds of nanometers, a very hot topic now, and a different two-dimensional materials with a thickness of less than one nanometer. For two-dimensional materials, usually there is no way of defined thickness because it has only a few layers of atoms or molecules. We cannot measure precisely their thickness. And the implication from this figure on the right hand side is that assuming that your fabrication process is perfect, this is the best voltage that you can ever achieve if you use these materials to make solar cell. And for each step to make the solar cell, you will reduce this value a little bit if that step is not perfect. From this graph here, we found that these new two dimensional materials are very promising they can give the voltages higher than one volts. Very possible to fabricate solar cell, but of course, 2D material was still quite new in the VV field. Then we go one step further. Why some materials cannot work as efficiently as others? Obviously, they must contain defects and impurities, right? But here the question is, which of the defects are more detrimental than the others? And which defect we should get rid of before the others? And this is an example from silicon. We investigate the characteristic light emitted from this location impurities inside the materials. Then we study the spatial distribution of these defects and impurities. We can see that the impurities are often de decorated along the location and reduce the performance of our materials. The message from this figure is that the decorating impurities are much more detrimental than the dislocation themselves. So if you want to improve your, your silicon material quality, getting rid of the impurities first before thinking about the dislocation. So that's the message that we find. So those are fundamental study. Now we move a step further. We develop techniques to monitor those fundamental properties. Here, I mentioned a little bit about luminescent imaging because these are very popular methods for solar cell research here. When you use a light source to shine on your materials or devices or apply a voltage, basically they can emit light. And if we have a camera, we can capture the image of this emitted light 
and we have a luminescent image. So in this sense, this is similar to the way that uh, we use a digital camera to capture the photos of our family or other objects. But in those photos, we are capturing the light reflected from the object to the camera. In luminescent imaging, you are capturing the light emitted from the object. So that's the difference. And at AMU, we optimize the speed, the spatial resolution, the accuracy of this technique. We also develop analysis methods to evaluate different properties of solid cell materials and devices based on this technique. And these are some examples on the left hand side here. So if you use your phones to capture a photo of a silicon wafer, what will you get? So basically your selfie image. And if you use a luminescent imaging method, you will get on the right hand side here. So basically you can detect different types of impurities and defects inside your wafer. And this is a, just a quarter wafer. If the fabrication process is not perfect, you may introduce defects and impurities into your wafers or you activate them if they are already there. This is another type of silicon wafer. We have a good regions. The bad regions would contain a lot of dislocation and impurities. From these images, we can extract a large amount of information. And another example is for porosky solar cell and emerging technology. This is a solar cell that we store in a nitrogen cabinet for two months. With our technique, we can detect the degradation around the edge using our imaging method. The, you can see the back gap of the material is changed around the edge because the air slowly invades the solar cell through the edge. When we put this cell in the air, the degradation happens much, much faster. And with our technique, we can visualize that. Those are the measurement techniques. We also develop techniques to improve the solar materials. First, for the surface of silicon solar cell, our team is working on the newest technology we call the basculating contact. So basically the silicon substrate, then we cap it with a stack of a very thin silicon oscillator, basically less than two nanometer thin, and a low poly silicon thin. So this stack, it can serve two purposes. First, it can protect the solar cell. Second, it can conduct electricity. However, the poise is also contained defects. And we develop a technique to, to inject atomic hydrogen into the contact structure to deactivate those defects. The methods is quite simple. First, we deposit a layer of hydrogen rich uh, uh, silicon nitride. Then we put the sample in a furnace at around 400 Celsius degree for 30 minutes. And during this step, atomic hydrogen from silicon nitride film can be moved into the vasculating contact structure. So with our technique, we can see a big improvement in the performance of our samples. Now, we move into the body of the substrate. When we receive the silicon wafer from the supplier, very often the wafer have already contained impurities and crystal defects, which are not good for our solar cell, obviously. So we investigate different ways to get rid of the impurities and defects, or at least deactivate them. We have a method called impurity gatherings by thermal diffusion process. So after a thermal diffusion step at very high temperature, most of the impurities can be removed out of the wafer, but the crystal defects are still there. Then if we continue doing hydrogenation process, we can basically deactivate the crystal defects. So what we found out is that we did to remove the impurity first and then deactivate the effects, not the other way around. Because if we deactivate the effect first by hydrogenation, the hydrogen atoms will leave really the sample during the impurity gatherings. So that's one of the findings that we give back to the cell fabrication uh, team. So in summary, the key message that I would like to deliver today is when we talk about solar cell research, it's not just about making solar cells. At ANU, my team is performing multiple approaches to improve the solar photovoltaics. We study the fundamental properties of material, develop the technique to monitor these properties, and also the material engineering. Of course, the end goal is just tries to have a better solar cell for everyone. And my research is supported by this organization, and these are my main research partners.
And thank you very much for your attention. I realize that we are slightly behind the behind schedule, so I would just uh, just allow myself to to say that even though we had a very uh, two very different topics, one of the on the storage uh, of, of energy with solid state battery, and another was the uh, on the uh, generation of the of the uh, photo power from uh, using the new types of the of um, uh, silicon photovoltaic and beyond silicon. There are still some similarities, uh, apart from the fact that, of course, the two technologies need to be used uh, in in conjunction to each other because you you have to store the energy which you which you generate somewhere in the uh, in the from the photovoltaics and one of the possibility is the other compact solid state batteries but also this interesting story on the influence of the of the dislocations and the and the grain boundaries which is which looks like being the dominant next step and most important next step for both solid solid state batteries and the and the 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 photovoltaic um, um uh, now, uh, should we? Where where are we going next? So, uh, are we going straight to the uh, to the uh, questions from the audience, or there is still call for nomination? Well, uh, yes, Professor Novoselov, uh, Professor Nato, and Dr. Hume, thank you so much for your very insightful contributions. And now, as we before we move on to the Q and A segment. I think it's only fair that we give our panelists a very well-deserved break of five minutes. And in the meantime, I would like to invite all of you to keep watch for a short video tutorial on how to submit your nominations to the V Future Prize. Please take a look. Greetings from the VIN Future Prize. Please find instructions for the nominator following these steps. To begin, you can access the nomination portal at online.vinfutureprize.org slash nomination. Alternatively, you can scan the QR code on the screen to open the nomination webpage. On this webpage, you can download the instructions and the endorsement letter template. In the instructions, you will find the complete nomination form where you can draft the nomination at your convenience. Afterwards, you can copy and paste draft into the online portal. Please click on sign up and upon successful registration, you can simply use your ID and password to log in. After logging in, please click here to start a new nomination form. Subsequently, you can see seven content tabs on the nomination form to begin the nomination process. On the first tab, please select the prize category as well as the type of nominee, whether it is an individual or a group of nominees. Then, click the Start button to proceed to the second tab, and we would like to draw your attention to tab number 5 and tab number 7. On tab number 5, your evaluation, you are invited to give your evaluation of the nominee's invention, including its groundbreaking discovery, scientific fundamental knowledge, specific approach, uniqueness, and advancement. Additionally, you are required to clarify if the invention can be transferred to a product and highlight its most significant socioeconomic impacts. This includes the number of beneficiaries, such as people, countries, and continents. Please explain how you believe this invention has or will potentially transform the everyday lives of millions, if not billions, of people. Next, please provide information on the history of the invention, such as when and how it started, and who else, except the nominee or nominees, was involved in initiating or contributing to the invention? About tab number seven, supporting documentation and evidence. There are several important documents that the nomination portal and form require. We would like to draw your attention to three critical items. The first one is the CV of your nominee or the CVs of your group of nominees if you are nominating a group of people. The second important item is the endorsement letter. Three endorsement letters are strongly encouraged, but one is mandatory. The third one is the additional form of nominees. Please provide as specific information as possible. 
Additionally, you are strongly encouraged to include any valid intellectual properties, publications, patents, or other supporting documents that provide evidence for the nomination. Finally, after filling out and providing all the content in the seven tabs, please click on the submit button at the bottom of the page to submit your nomination. From my side, I've been on the selection committee for a number of years. I would like to encourage people to to nominate uh, the technologies for this for this prize because we have a number of uh, technologies ranging from the very established to the uh, to the uh, uh, to the emerging. So. And we also um, let ourselves to combine some of the nominations. So, in fact, the chances uh, for the interest in technologies are very high. Well, Professor Nobuso, thank you so much to your, uh, for your contributions and, of course, for your sharing as well. We really appreciate you being in our prize council. And uh, coming up next, ladies and gentlemen, one of the most highly anticipated parts is now upon us in the webinar, the Q&A segment. And now during this segment, uh, we encourage you, we highly encourage you to, inter uh, to directly approach and interact with our panelists by use the raise hand function. But of course, if you prefer a more indirect approach, approach, just kindly send in your questions and we will try our best to assign them to a suitable panelist during a designated time frame. And now, actually, we already received a signal from a member of our audience, uh, who is Professor uh, Zheng Xiu Gao from the University of Hong Kong. And uh, do we have Professor uh, Zheng Xiu Gao in the member in the audience right now? I believe you do have a question that you would like to send in to Professor Nato. Can I uh, ask the question? Uh -huh. Yeah, please. Yes, yes, Professor. Yeah, it's a, it's a question for Professor Nato, and again, um, you know. Solid states on a contaction is both a classical problem and a topical uh, issue, as you rightly saying. For you know, solid state uh, ionic conduction in in batteries and other energy storage uh, you know systems, uh, including solid state electrolyzers as well. Now, again, I'm very uh, you know impressed with the fundamental formulation to look at uh, uh, conduct mobility with uh, the what what I would call a, a potential space. Considering the you know various factors, now being a chemist, I just wanted to, <laughs> to ask a question to see how this formulation could be uh, clearly or more clearly linked to the classical concept of uh, you know chemical potential gradients, which drives the mobility, the flux of you know charge carriers and and uh, other issues. I wonder whether you could expand on, on this particular topic. Yes. So, so just like in you know in electronic systems, of course, when you apply an electric field right between the two electrodes, you do have a, a, a gradient, a chemical gradient across the material. In this uh, in this case of the mobility, is what's determining uh, the the actual value of the mobility is the scattering of the ions by the crystal lattice now of course one of the fundamental questions is that is this a classical scattering or is it a quantum scattering what's going on right so in fact it's a combination because the ion of course is is very very heavy right uh, one proton is a thousand times uh, uh, heavier than an electron Right, and you have many protons and neutrons in the ion. So, as a whole, the 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 ion is a classical object. However, this uh, the both the ion and the crystal they have electrons, and the electrons they feel the presence of the ion and they react to the presence of the ion. So, that's a quantum mechanical effect. So, essentially, it's a combination of quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. It's a very interesting thing. Uh, uh, and uh, to be honest with you, I don't think we understand completely what happens uh, when these ions are moving around of a crystal. Uh, it's This is very early days for this kind of problem. Indeed, thank you. Uh, on that particular note, if I may um, ask uh, in, the, this is probably the most more detailed uh, kind of simulations. Uh, 
uh, particular ionic mobility when we look at, at classical uh, bone hyponemia uh, uh, approximation, where you treat ionic science as a fixed the electrons as mobile. But, but yeah. in this case, it's both. So how yes. do you handle that? You yeah, so so you 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 use a born Oppenheimer because the electrons are still much faster than the ions. So one way to imagine this is that as the ion is cruising through the unit cell of the crystal, right? It's like an impurity level which is floating in the band structure. Okay, as the ion moves, this impurity level is going up and down. And then, you know, depending on how close this can get to the bottom of the conduction band or top of the valence band, you can have electronic transitions, which are induced by the presence of the ion. So it's a, it's a complicated dance, what happens there. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll read the table later. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Nato, for addressing uh, Professor Zheng Xiao Gao's question. And coming up next, we actually do have, we received another signal from a member of our audience uh, whose name is Mosen Tamtaji. Uh, do we have Mr. Mosen uh, Tamtaji in the audience right now? And a bit, I believe you have a question that you would like to send in to Dr. Hill. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, yeah. hello, Mosen. Yeah. Hello, Professor Konstantin and Professor uh, Castro. It's very really great pleasure for me to talk to you today. So I really enjoyed the talk and I have a very uh, quick question on the solid electrolyte. So my question is uh, is very simple, but uh, uh, maybe a very big question. What is your opinion about the future of zinc uh, air batteries and the, um, the bottleneck of zinc air battery and also the uh, like the fundamental uh, investigations on the solid electrolytes in the zinc air batteries? You know, I, I'm of the opinion that different types of batteries have different applications, right? I don't think there is one battery that addresses all the issues that in terms of applications, right? So batteries which are used for cars are not necessarily the same or batteries that you're going to use for satellites. So uh, I think that, you know, there is a space for all types of different uh, types of batteries. Um, I cannot comment on zinc air because, you know, I never worked with it before. But what I can tell you about solid state uh, electrolyte or solid state batteries is that we are still in the early days. There was a, a few years back, there was a lot of uh, excitement and hype around this type of batteries. But the, the reality is that the science of this type of battery has not been developed yet. We're very in early days. What people do is try or an error. So they cook a crystal and then they put there and they try to see if something happens. If it doesn't happen, they change the chemical composition and so on and so forth. And this is uh, like a random walk, right? You don't go very far with this kind of approach. So this is what essentially stimulated us to look at this problem from a microscopic perspective. So if you, we could get the fundamental laws that, con, that uh, control ionic motion in crystals. So only after that is that we're going to be able to actually uh, produce solid state batteries that actually work. Again, my analogy with semiconductor physics in the 1950s, 1960s, right? The transistor was only invented after people understood how semiconductors work. Not before. <laughs> Nobody went there to try to make a semiconductor before understanding what a semiconductor is. So I, 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 I say as a joke that for solid state batteries, we are in the 1950s. So there is a long ro road ahead. From my perspective. Oh, yeah, thank Antonio, you. just just maybe yeah. maybe just while we are on this topic, we can answer the question from Le Le Kuang. Uh, what's your view, roughly? What, what's the TRL level of the solid state battery technology uh, as of today? I think that we are TRL three. Okay. 
Great. So we answered one more question. Right. So Thank you. Still, there is very big way to go for solid electrolyte, even for zinc L battery or like. But the most the most part is on lithium batteries, the solid electrolytes. So that's why I just asked about the zinc L battery, and it seems there is very big way to go for this area. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank so, you so much. Thank you. Next question. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Nato, and of course to Mr. Mohsen Tamtaji for joining us today in the, the webinar, and of course for your question in the Q&A segment. And now coming up next, uh, can I please connect to Dr. Ben John Menure in the audience? Uh, I believe you do have a question, and can you please state uh, what, who would you like to address this question to? Ladies and gentlemen, please allow us a few seconds to uh, connect to our next audience member, Dr. Ben John Menure. Uh, can you please use the raise hand function, doctor, if you uh, would like to send in your questions? The current solid state batteries that are being produced are essentially granular. So they make the polycrystalline material and then they press it together and make some powder. And they, they do some sintering or something like that. So, of course, the material has lots of interfaces, internal interfaces, grain boundaries, voids, and all sorts of defects. And uh, I think that uh, the current solid-state batteries, they are controlled by those defects. Right. Yeah. So, so, so we're still very long way from having single crystal batteries. Nobody has done that yet. So thank you, Antonio. So that, that was the question from Philip uh, Atkinson, and I think we simultaneously answered partly to the question of James Christian uh, Lagalla. That is it? Is this field related to the ceramic engineering at this moment? Yes, whether fortunate or 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 unfortunate. So it is essentially ceramic, as 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 Antonio mentioned. So of course we are looking forward for the improvements of the quality where where of the crystals where the mobility can be significantly increased. Hien, uh, back to you. Well, thank you so much for your questions. And the next person that we would like to invite is Dr. James Kristen Lagolo. Can we please uh, connect to Dr. James Kristen Lagolo? And, uh, and what question would you like to address and who would you like to address it to? The question is, how is it related? How the state of the modern solid straight battery is related to the physics of, of ceramics. Oh, okay. So, in fact, uh, because the materials used for solid-state batteries have to be electrical insulators, ceramics are very good candidates uh, for uh, ionic conductors. And many of these materials are either ceramics or oxide. I'm getting a lot of feedback noise here, but uh, essentially, yes, ceramics is a very good group of materials that have huge potential for ionic conductors. And of course, our last question for today's webinar, ladies and gentlemen, belongs to Mr. Le Kung from the uh, audience. Can we please connect to uh, Mr. Le Kung? And uh, what question would you like to ask and who would you like to address it to? Yes, thank you, uh, moderator. My question is for the both uh, speakers. So my question is, uh, I'm, I'm interested in the application in employment of this technology. So my question is, uh, what is the technology or threat unit level uh, of this technology, yeah, especially uh, in the power sector or in uh, any the other application area? I think I can answer this question from my perspective. So it's, uh, let, let me repeat the question. It's not the question about the TRL technology level readiness, right? Yeah. Correct. I think uh, yeah. all, yeah. all of I mean, I mean uh, uh, techno technology readiness level of uh, this. Yes. Yeah. So because I present the application for the for a range of technologies, but we can break down basically for silicon. It's already outside the market right now, right? Because not the dominant technologies, but like for most of the time, the technique that we are developing, so that in collaboration with industry, so that directly go to the industry. So I would say the technology readiness, like like, like three or four, or sometimes we can move up to five, but it's not outside for the market yet, 
because yeah, the the the, the R and D team of the company is our customer for Borosky and two dimensional material. I would say that the TRL added one or two. If I'm not saying too much, because that we still have a long way to go, because that's mainly in the laboratory now. So that's still like proof of concept, but not outside for the market or even outside for the R and D team of the companies yet. So do I answer your questions? Thank you so much uh, to Mr. Lei Kuang for sending in your questions and joining with us. And of course, thank you to Dr. Hyo Nguyen for concluding our Q&A segment. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as we reach the very end of today's webinar, we wholeheartedly extend our deepest gratitude to our members of the panel. Uh, Professor Kostya Novoselov, thank you so much for your exceptional leadership as today's chair, Professor Antonio Castronedo. Your profound insights has tremendously enriched our understanding of the topic deliberated upon. And of course, uh, we cannot overlook the significance presents of uh, Dr. Hyo Nguyen, our representative of the Vietnamese scientific community. We also would like to thank our audience for a very engaging Q&A segment and a very engaging engagement of yours. Uh, as we come to the end of today's webinar, we would like to take a moment to capture this very special occasion by inviting you all to turn on your camera as we would like to take a group photo with you. And now can we please, uh, can I please invite everybody to turn on your camera, please? Okay, I'm gonna start the countdown process now. Okay, three, two, one. Let's all give a big smile to end today's webinar. All right, thank you very much. Uh, once again, thank you all for being a part of today's Innovate Talk. Uh, just, I just want to keep you all updated and in the loop is that next month, uh, the month of November, will mark the very end of uh, the 2023 Innovate Talk uh, webinar series. So we hope to see you again very anytime soon. And we look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you very much and goodbye.